Hello, guys, gals, non-binary pals, thought forms, aliens, or other. Welcome to the Sci-Fi Lab. I'm your host, DJ Squared. With me is... Harper. And our uh, special guest calling in from New York is Dr. Marlene Barr. Would you like to say hello, Dr. Barr? Hello, DJ. I'm really glad to be on the show, and I'm happy to talk to your audience and tell them about my new forthcoming Trump anthology, The Feminist Science Fiction Justice League, Quashes the Orange Outrage Pussy Grabber. <laughs> Which is a mouthful to say, but makes me makes me happy. Yeah, it's delightful. <laughs> Well, I like the title, and I hope that readers will like it, too. Well, it punches to the chase, and that's what I think he is, an orange outrage pussy cramper. And that's in my Queens accent that I share with him, because I grew up in Forest Hills, Queens, and he went to elementary school there at the Q Forest School, and I have the same accent that he does, and I speak with his cadence, and when the President of the United States comes from where you come from, you're supposed to be proud, and I'm not proud, I'm disgusted, and that's why... All these stories came out of me. Who ever heard of having a president who was a pussy cramper? It's ridiculous. I feel like I'm on an alternative dystopian planet. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of us do too. <laughs> um, but that's why uh, I know I am, I am uh, anticipating your anthology uh, with bated breath here. <laughs> well, thank you. It makes me happy to hear that. <laughs> And I hope after the, read, the listeners hear me read my story, they will feel the same way. Because yeah. I think I think that art is an act of resistance, and this is what I could do to try to do something about Trump. I have a very satirical voice, and I'm a New Yorker, and I'm sort of like being like Mel Brooks in The Producers, where he took on Hitler. And of course, no one is say, I'm not saying that Trump is Hitler, but he's a leader that I don't like, and I'm using satire to take him on, just like Mel Brooks did. <laughs> well, we're excited to hear it. What's uh, your first story? Well, the first story is called Two Trump Heads Are Better Than One. And that's with a question mark. And it's about my alter ego protagonist, Professor Sandra Lear, who's really me, although she stays in her 30s forever, and she's thinner than I am now, but she's still me. So I'll tell you the story about Sandra encountering Trump. Okay. So, so two Trump heads are better than one. Professor Sandra Lear, a feminist science fiction scholar who teaches at the Metropolitan University of New York, could not ignore the persistent pain in her molar. Thus it came to pass that she found herself sitting in an oral surgeon's chair about to have her tooth extracted. Do you want to put growth material in your gum to facilitate implant insertion? asked Dr. Doogie Horowitz. Sandra, who was scared as hell that she was about to be decapitated, nodded her head affirmatively. When she returned for her post-operative checkup, she asked for details about what had been inserted in her mouth. Bone, Dr. Horowitz said. What kind of bone? Bone from a cadaver. What if the cadaver wasn't Jewish? I might have goyish bone cells reproducing in my jaw. Sandra went home and fell asleep. Upon awakening, she felt a weird sensation on her shoulder. She looked into a mirror and saw a second head attached to her body. The head did not look like a normal head. It had a full, pursed mouth, steely eyes framed by white makeup, and a very strange orange haircut. Yes, Trump's talking head was pervasive in the old Trump all the time media circus, but having Trump's head attached to her body right next to her own head was the limit. Sandra immediately phoned the surgeon. I have an emergency. The cells grew into Trump's head, not new jawbone. Whoops, said Dr. Horowitz. The cells I used came from Trump's deceased parents who were buried locally in New Hyde Park. 
Instead of simply generating new jawbone cells, these cells grow into a completely formed Trump head. Will I gain weight? Trump is not thin, and, I, and he eats, I can barely say it, fried taco shells. And if he had access to my hands, does that mean that he can grope my pussy? The Trump head has no control over your body. How do I get my normal Trump head of body back? I need some time to research this unprecedented question. Sandra decided to get a heads up on the situation by seeking an audience with Trump himself in Trump Tower. She put on a burger to disguise the Trump head. Politically correct New Yorkers rose to stare at a burger clad woman would not notice the covered shoulder protrusion. Sandra entered Trump Tower and asked to speak to Trump. Fearing that a woman wearing a burqa had to be a terrorist, secret service agents swarmed around her. Frantically fisting, fisting her in search of a gun or a bomb, they instead closely encountered Trump's head. I'm not a terrorist, Sandra insisted. I obviously have a huge problem. Trump has a swelled head. Maybe he has a suggestion. The agents escorted Sandra to Trump's apartment. He became enraged when he saw his head attached to Sandra. Get me a guillotine, screamed Trump. Two Trump heads are absolutely not better than one. Sir, presidents are not allowed to behead people, said a secret surgeon, service agent. Trump began to tweet. Dr. Sandra Lee doesn't know how to use my head. Not. Then he continued to shout, I'll use the nuclear codes to explode the hell out of the imposter Trump head. Sir, employed, employed the agent, it is not advisable to deploy nuclear weapons simply because the second Trump head hurts your ego. Can't we blame the Mexicans? Initiate a travel plan to protect, to prevent any other Trump head from entering the country? Trump's real head, not his alternative head, suddenly exploded. Flying cranium, cranium shards became projectiles which hit the Trump head attached to Sandra and severed it. Dr. Horowitz closed the hole in Sandra's shoulder. She recovered completely and survived four years of President Pence. Although she did not agree with Pence, she was grateful that he was not sick in his head. <laughs> All right. I live, I live with my own stories, and I wrote this at the beginning of the collection, so I am a literary critic, and if I could diagnose myself, I think it's very funny, and I'm sitting here laughing. It's hilarious. That was great. <laughs> Would you, like story, would you like story number two? Yeah, definitely. Yes. Okay, this story also involves my alter ego, Professor Sandra Lear, and it's called Swan Song for Trump. Professor Sandra Lear decided that she could not, not for one more microsecond, abide Donald Trump's diatribes. I wish I could do something science fictional to silence Trump, she said aloud. She was distraught to the extent that she continued to talk to herself. It's a shame that I know all of this science fiction theory, but can't reify my knowledge. I wish I could send Trump to the Phantom Zone. I wish I could give him a one-way ticket for a voyage to the planet Arcturus, or to any planet located in a galaxy far, far away. Fantasy princesses have fairy godmothers. Hey, just because a feminist spirit really doesn't fit the usual Jewish American princess qualifications, why can't I have a fairy godmother? I wish I had a fairy godmother. Your wish is my command, said a patrician voice. Sandra's office at the State University of New York at Greenwich Village was suddenly engulfed in smoke. When the smoke cleared, Sandra saw a white-haired lady wearing tailored clothes and pearls. Mrs. Bush, said Sandra incredulously, 
Why have you materialized in my office? I'm your fairy godmother. My fairy godmother? I'm a fervent liberal Democrat. How can the quintessential Republican matriarch be my fairy godmother? We're now on the same side, dear. My antipathy for Trump knows no bounds. The nerve of him calling my jet low energy. How dare he support my jet's presidential ambitions? You're someone who's, who's comfortable having a fairy godmother. So I've come to tell you how to shut Trump's mouth. I'm listening. The answer is general semantics. Even though I'm a literary critic, I don't see how words can silence Trump. People routinely play with the name Trump. They mention Trump cards and being Trump. But nobody applies Trump to animals. Donald Trump is for the birds. Trump and his swans can't count to him. Trump and his swans? I'm still listening. Yes, Trump and his swans. Hitchcock knew that birds have power. As a bona fide fairy godmother, I fraternize with fantastic creatures, such as fire-breathing trumpet swans. You can summon one and ride her to a destination of your choice. Like a cross between Uber and dragon riders? Exactly. When riding astride a fire-breathing trumpet swan, you can look Trump straight in the eye and say, you are fired. I love illocutionary force. I'm in. Mrs. Bush told Sandra that a fire-breathing trumpet swan flock was roosting in the university parking lot. The flock leader waddled toward Sandra, squawked a greeting, lowered her neck, and extended her wing. Sandra climbed up and clung to the swan's neck. Since sitting on the back of a giant swan is quite comfortable, Sandra remained calm. Ready for takeoff, she recalled that Trump was scheduled to speak in Greensboro, North Carolina, later that evening. Fly to Greensboro, she cried. The leader ascended as the flock lined up in formation behind her. Soon, Sandra and her avian colleagues were hovering over the Trump rally. Everybody pile up your Make America Great Again signs, ordered Trump, excuse me, ordered Sandra from her perch. When the giant fire-breathing Trump of the swan opened her beak, even the earliest racist complied. The swan directed a flame at the piled signs and hence burned them to smithereens. This swan must be a Hillary supporter, proclaimed Trump, a corporate, lying, fire-breathing bird. Look at how huge it is. A rapist swan, an immigrant from a fairy tale. I'm going to build a wall. You can build all the walls you want, retorted Sandra. There are more such swans where this one came from. They can fly over your wall. I'll have the swan shot and turned into barbecue. Great marketing potential. Trump, Trump and his swan steaks. The flock aimed a flame at Trump's red baseball cap. Just as his hair was about to catch fire, a secret service agent threw a blanket of water on his head. Regaining his composure, Trump said, the Second Amendment advocates need to do something about these swans. The entire flock squawked and drowned Trump out. They set fire to all the Make America Great Again hats. Four rocks and flustered by the fire-breathing flock sound barrage, the wind there deflated into dumbfounded silence. Barbara Bush materialized in the auditorium. You're on fire, she trumpeted to Trump in tandem with Sandra. Mrs. Bush snapped her fingers. A mirror appeared. This is a mirror mirror on the wall, she said to Trump. Who is the most ludicrous of us all? Until you can answer, you'll spend eternity in front of this mirror watching Alec Baldwin portray the truth, your lack of, a, of ability to reflect. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well then. So I have a couple questions for you right off the bat. 
Um, sure. So I was telling DJ earlier that I had dental work this morning, and I have so much dental anxiety, so that would be my worst fear, <laughs> growing a Trump head off of my shoulder because of some dental accident. <laughs> Uh, how did you get the inspiration for that story? Well, that's very easy to answer. I really did have my tooth extracted, and the dentist really did not want to tell me that the bone came from a cadaver. And he says he said it came from a cadaver, and most people would would really shut up at that, and they wouldn't say, I don't know what the word means, but since I'm an English professor, I know what cadaver means, and I got really, really scared, because I didn't want dead people's cells in my jaw. And since Trump is local to me, I knew that his mother was, his mother died in New Hyde Park in Long Island Jewish Hospital. And I'm familiar with that because when I was a child, I had an operation in Long Island Jewish Hospital. And I said, well, Trump and Trump's parents are buried in New Hyde Park. And knowing all this and being scared of the cadaver and the cells and having my tooth removed, I just extrapolated and I said, well, if these if these cells come from a dead body and Trump's parents are, are buried locally, what if I had Trump's parents' cells in my jaw and it erupted into a Trump head? It made perfect sense to me and it's based upon reality. It's just my knowledge of being a local person and I, I just know all these things. Well, that was, that's uh, de definitely an uh, inter interesting way to... Uh, Get a different perspective? <laughs> what about the second story? What was your inspiration for that one? Well, I think that the second one, I was just playing with words, and I was thinking Trump, Trump, and I came up with trumpeter swan because nobody had thought of that. And I said, well, what do I do with the trumpeter swan? And I said, well, maybe I'll make it a fire-breathing trumpeter swan because I, I sort of never heard of a, tri a fire-breathing trumpeter swan. And I put the fantasy trope of a fairy godmother in there, and I said, well, who could be the fairy godmother? And in one of my novels, Mrs. Bush was the fairy godmother of Sandra, and I said, well, why don't I have Mrs. Bush come back? Because the Bushes are sort of on our side now. Just today, I was reading that George Bush Jr. was in Abu Dhabi, and he was impugning Trump and saying, he didn't mention Trump, but he said that the Russians definitely colluded. And the idea that in the future, I would think that the Bushes are on my side, I, I can't believe that. <laughs> but, it, but it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Because Trump did call Jeff Bush low energy, and, and all the Bushes are angry at him. And, and again, uh, George, uh, the younger Bush, said something today that I like. Who would have thunk it? Yeah. It's a weird turn of events here. Yeah, strange times. <laughs> And even then, I would like Mitt Romney, and if Mitt Romney gets to be the senator from Utah, that would be a good thing, because he's a normal, I mean, he's a Republican, but at least he's not crazy either. <laughs> so who would have thought that, that I could like Bush and Romney? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have... And I hope... Oh, I just hope in 10 years from now, I'm not sitting here saying, oh my God, I wish we had Trump, because look what we have now. I'm trying to hope that it'll swing in the opposite direction, and we'll get like a normal, democratic, sane person to be the president. Yeah, I think that's, what, hoping, I think that's what we all hope. That. Yes. Um, but, but, hey, but hey, you never know. No, you really don't. Would vote for a swan, though. <laughs> um, so I, one of my questions is, do is your entire anthology, um, do all of your stories involve Sandra? No. Um, some of them do, all of them don't. No. Okay. But, um, Sandra just pop, pops up in my mind sometimes, but they, they are not all about Sandra. Okay. How many stories in total do you have? Two Sandra stories for continuity. Okay. How many stories do you have? Like I believe there are like I don't I, I I never really counted them. I'd say like a 
approximately 20 stories. But don't, well, don't quote me on this. <laughs> <laughs> you just saying it on the radio. But I started writing them during, during his campaign, and I just kept writing, and they were a lot. And I... I contributed to the BQ Press first anthology, Alternative Truth, and the editor, Bob Brown, whose who's dependent said, well, I like this story, and since I'm a New York marketer, I said, well, Bob, I have a lot of other stories. Where this comes from, would you do an anthology? And he said, okay, and I was thrilled. <laughs> so then this feminist science fiction justice league quashes the orange outrage pussy grab I was born. <laughs> when does the book come out? It comes out on April 1st, which is April Fool's Day, as we all know, and that may have some, that may have some significance, but I'm not sure what yet. I think it's real. I think, it, I think it's excellent. It works. I think that's the best possible day to release a book like this. Why do you think that you could give me an idea? <laughs> I mean, well, it's just... Well, Trump is a fool, so that's one, <laughs> that's one way one of thing. looking at it. There's one thing. Um, I think, like... It, by releasing it on April Fool's Day, there will be the people who will pick it up thinking that it's a joke, and then the rest, the rest of the year, then that's when they realize, oh, it's not. <laughs> it's no joke. <laughs> so that, at the very least, you might bring in a uh, a few extra extra buyers that day. That sounds like a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And um. Do you have any, like, are one, either of the stories that you read to us, are they, like, your favorites, or do you have any others that really stand out to you? I don't think, I'm not sure if I have any favorites. I think I just read those because they have already been published on the internet, so I thought for expediency's sake I had them, and, and they were all, like, all formatted and everything, and I, and they're all, they're all proofread because the book is in press now and it's still getting proofread. And I think I just had finished products, so I thought that I would offer that. And if anybody likes these stories and they want to look at them again before April 1st when the whole book comes out, if you Google Marlene Barr and Trump, the stories that I have published from the anthology will come up. So if you're chopping at the bit to see these or more, you can get at them. I definitely will. <laughs> yeah, that's that's good to know. Send them to my siblings. <laughs> Send them to your siblings as like a ha ha look at this or as a hey you guys look at this. A little bit of I both. Don't think, <laughs> I don't think I have I don't think I have a favorite. Like I don't have any children. And I think if I had children I would like them all the same and I think I like all the stories the same. <laughs> and they they just kept popping out for a year. But right now they're not coming out anymore. I, I don't know why. I, I, I can't answer why I'm not writing any more Trump stories now. Maybe I'm all Trumped out. <laughs> yeah, and then I was about to say, maybe you're just tired. Like, we're all tired. I was Trumped out before he was even elected president. <laughs> like, yesterday, I saw that uh, he was going on to Air Force One, and the wind blew his hair apart in the back, and you saw his bald, naked head, and it was like, Vomitatious. I, 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 I don't know. It looked like a like you could just see the truth and how everything is a sham and, and how his hair is also a lie and, and it, it was it was like when the uh, when Dorothy when Toto pushes the curtain and Dorothy sees that the Wizard of Oz is, is a sham behind the machine. I think that the hair thing where you see it, it's just the facade is really important and. I don't know if it's humorous. I think it's just disgusting. And if I was still writing Trump stories, I would do something with, with the hair and the head. Well, mm -hmm. I guess I already did the head, as you know. <laughs> but I guess I'll just quit on the head and not do that story. <laughs> quit your head. Um, I mean, there's a, if you do feel like writing another one, there's always you could always put another face on the back of his head that's definitely not Lord Voldemort. <laughs> Well, that's another good idea, and I thank you for that. This is a very productive conversation. <laughs> You're welcome. I am I am right for the ideas. <laughs> oh no. Um Do you have any other um anything else you're working on right now? 
Like, other than the anthology? Any fiction? Um, fiction, non-fiction, just anything. I'm a very productive scholar, and I turn to writing fiction, which is a strange thing for a scholar to do, because there are Scholarly writing and humor writing do not go hand in hand. And I think that right now I'm absorbed with trying to get this book out and trying to market it, which is really, really hard if you're not a household name writer. And all of my energy is going into that. And when it gets to be April 1st and the thing is out and I have more marketing things in place, then I'll turn to another project and I think it would be an academic project and not a fiction project because again I'm all trumped out and that's all my brain is thinking about and I did an academic series called Future Females uh, many many moons ago and it was the first anthology of feminist science fiction and I did two two volumes of Future Females, three in total, and I think I might do a new Future Females volume, like maybe Global Future Females, something like that. So I think to answer your question, I would do a new Future Females volume. And I'm also writing short pieces on the internet, and they can be, if anyone is interested, they can be found in CUNY Academic Works. So if you Google Marlene Barr, CUNY Academic Works, you could find my short fiction uh, and my short pieces. There, there are also some non-fiction pieces there. That's good. That's, that's good to know. That's what I'm doing. Okay. I'll probably also put links in the description of the of the video so that people can find that easier. Because I know I'm definitely going to be looking into it. Uh, after we're done here. <laughs> so, Dr. Barr, you're a professor, is that correct? Yes. What? I, teach at the, I teach at the City University of New York, English. What kind of classes? I, I know you said English, but do you teach um, any particular type of literature? Well, right now, I'm teaching composition, and I really love to teach composition because I'm teaching students a skill that they can use, and I use literature in my composition class, and the term just started, so I'm kind of like, do you have the syllabus, and hello, I'm Dr. Barr, and <laughs> those things, but I'm going to teach The Power by Naomi Alderman, which I'm very excited about, and I'm told that this book is the perfect book for the Me Too moment, so I can't wait to teach The Power, the Me Too moment book. And I'm sort of, I don't know, chagrined because I was saying that feminist science fiction was really important a long, long time ago. Like when I was a graduate student, I was running around to my eminent male professors, Leslie Fieber and Norman N. Holland, and at me in my 20s, I was saying, Le Guin is, is, is important, look at Le Guin, and they believe me, and Norm wrote an article called You, UK Le Guin, for my Future Females book when I was a very young scholar, and I loved, I loved that he did that, and I was teaching uh, Margaret Atwood, The Handmaid's Tale, and I taught that at the University of Iowa, and I walked into class and I was wearing a red dress and a white hat imitating a handmaid to graduate students, and I thought it would be interesting and the students said we don't like this we really respect you dr bar we don't want you looking like a handmaid and i i was the first scholar to i was the first scholar responsible for the publication of the first article about octavia butler and i had my very very good friend and my very good friend and the fellow feminist scholar ruth salvaggio write the first essay scholarly essay about Octavia Butler, and during those years, feminist science fiction, science fiction was seen as crap, and feminist science fiction was seen as beyond the pale of crap, and you can't see me because this is radio, but I have still very thick hair, and I'm glad that I did because I got bashed in my head during my early 
academic years, so being a feminist science fiction scholar, but I was really prescient, and now I can look back and say, I was right, <laughs> and I was. And isn't that the best feeling? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, it is well, the best feeling. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much for talking with us. Um, I think we're we're good for we're uh, about to wrap up here. So, thank you so much. Those were some very very hilarious and interesting stories. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. I'll speak for myself. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. It was a pleasure talking to you. And it was a pleasure talking to you. Um, I can't wait till April Fool's Day. <laughs> yes. All right. So that's all for the Sci-Fi Lab this week. Thank you for listening.